Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, one of the best things about having a YouTube channel and having the reach that I've been able to have with now over 360,000 subscribers, thank you by the way for that, uh, is that it has given me opportunities to meet other people who are creating content on YouTube and become friends with some of these people. I have this growing circle of friends. You uh, heard me talk a lot about my friend JD from the History Underground, who I've known for about two years now, and um, gotten to meet guys like Sander from Sander VK History, uh, and uh, Mr. Beat, and Jarrett from Genia Vlogger, and um, Cypher from um, the Cynical Historian, folks like that that have become friends. And uh, one of the people that I've had the privilege of not only getting to meet, but also spending time with together uh, is Rob, who has the channel History in Your Hand. Rob is a professional photographer, uh, and he actually gets to take pictures at sports events. And he's the one who, uh, my last time in the UK back in January, took me to see my first Premier League match. We went to see Fulham, which is his team, uh, against Tottenham Hotspur. It was a fantastic night we had an amazing time and then we were together on the tour in belgium later that week we actually met for the first time in ypres in belgium he was there to make videos for his channel and we had dinner in ypres so uh that was exciting and rob's an awesome guy and i'm sure that he and i are going to be spending more time together i know i'm going to see him here in a few weeks in normandy uh so i thought it would be an awesome opportunity to shine a light on his channel he's got a little under six thousand subscribers and He's got a passion for history. He's a, uh, excellent when it comes to using a camera, obviously. Uh, so he actually tried something new. Most of his stuff is stuff from battlefields, and he's going to be going. He and I are both going to be in the Somme together in a couple of weeks. Um, but he decided to try something a little different, rather than battlefield content. He's actually shooting something from his home studio. Uh, top five misconceptions about World War One. Uh, I am proud, by the way, to be his very first patron. He just set up a Patreon, uh, and I, I love supporting fellow content creators uh, with what they do. Uh, so I'll put a link in the description to the original video of this. Highly encourage you to check out his channel. He's got a lot of stuff from France and Belgium, you know, places uh, walking in the steps of Easy Company, but also stuff about the First World War, some great stuff about the Manchesters at the Battle of the Somme, places like that. Definitely check him out. I would love to see us give him a big boost in subscribers today, uh, and maybe a couple of new patrons as well. So we're going to take a look at uh, his misconceptions about World War One and do a reaction to this one. Today, we're going to be talking about the top five myths associated with the Great War, with World War One. Hey guys, so welcome to a slightly different type of video today. Um, we're not out and about on the battlefield, we are right here in the office. This is where I normally film videos for my other YouTube channel. If you're interested in checking that out, it's uh, Rob Sambles. It's a, a channel all about cameras and photography, so check that out if you would like to. But today we're going to talk about the top five myths associated with the First World War. Whenever I'm getting into kind of my World War One history and reviewing things, you always see certain comments that people make on videos or certain perceptions that people seem to have true. and sometimes not all of them are entirely true and so I've picked out five of what I think are kind of five of the big ones and I'm going to share those with you today. So the first thing I would say before he even gets into this is I think as Americans uh, our general knowledge of the first world war is pretty lacking compared to what the average American knows about, say, the Second World War. And I think a lot of that has to do with our level of involvement. You know, we weren't nearly as involved in the First World War as countries like the UK were. And so I think when you go there, when you go to France, when you go to Belgium, you can see that the First World War is very much still on uh, in the front of people's minds. Even though 100 years have gone by, uh, they are very aware of what happened in that war, especially in their local towns. And there are these great memorials to the men who died from each of these towns. U.S. doesn't have that level of involvement. Most of our casualties in the First World War came in just the last couple of months, even the last few weeks of the war. Whereas a country like the U.K. was involved from start to finish and had many times over the number of casualties that we did. So I feel like folks like Rob and folks in the UK, folks in France, folks in Belgium and Germany, um, they're probably less likely to have these misconceptions than the average American might be. 
Before I get into it, do me a favour, hit the like button on the video. It really helps me out on this channel and I really, really appreciate it. Think about subscribing if you haven't already. You can follow some of my other social media channels as well. I'm going to put them all on the screen right here because I'm on pretty much everything social media now. And I've got different types of videos, full ones, short videos, reels, stuff like that. Check those out if you're interested. Okay, so first of all, myth number one. And that is to say that most of the soldiers that were killed in the Great War were killed by machine gun fire. Artillery. Going over the top and running across no man's land. Well, actually, that isn't the case. Whilst there were a huge amount of casualties killed by machine gun fire and a lot of people killed in horrendous situations running across no man's land under machine gun fire, it's actually about two thirds of the total casualties in the Great War were killed by artillery fire. Yep. There were tremendous artillery barrages on both sides in the Great War. In some cases, they were continuous, shells 24 hours per day. And of course, those had the potential to cause horrendous injuries or even death, regardless of where the soldiers were. They could be hidden away in trenches, they could even be behind the lines, or of course, they could be out front running across no man's land. So yeah, so a couple of things he talks about there. Number one, talks about artillery being hidden in trenches, and that's true. They actually had these, what were called trench mortars. And they could, they could lob a shell a short distance, which was needed in some of these places where the trench, the front lines are really close to each other. And it could lob it almost straight up and out. So, so you could have it sitting down in a trench. In fact, if you see my video from uh, Valcois, I show an example of a trench mortar down in a trench to show how that worked. But uh, yeah, and you have, you have small artillery pieces all the way up to these huge rail guns at times that would launch shells 20, 30 miles. Uh, I don't think we fully grasp the scale of the artillery in the First World War. I mean, descriptions of, uh, for example, the Somme. All right, there's a there's a, a artillery barrage that goes on leading up to the uh, attack on the Somme. I think it lasted a week. Something like two million shells fired along a 20 mile stretch, and that is nothing compared to what was done at a place like Verdun where just the number of shells per square yard that were fired is just impossible to comprehend. And, and you have stories of uh, a tree blowing, blown, being blown up in the air and before it could even land, another artillery shell hits and throws it back in the air again. And it, they talk about drum roll artillery where it wasn't just like boom, boom, boom. It was boom, 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 boom. Non-stop. Uh, the the psychological effect alone must have been just impossible to imagine. You could be killed by the concussion from shells. There are descriptions at, at places like Ypres, I think in Polygon Wood, where they came upon this German bunker with like a dozen dead Germans in it. And none of them had a scratch on them. They had been killed by the concussion from an exploding artillery shell. So yeah, artillery is the, the vast majority of casualties. It's not gas. Gas was like tens of thousands of deaths. Uh, machine guns, yes. You have these attacks. You have days like the Somme, 19,000 British killed in one day, and a lot of them are from machine guns. But those are in those rare mass frontal attacks. Those didn't happen every day, but artillery happened every single day. But about two thirds of the total casualties in the Great War were actually killed by artillery shells and the majority were not killed by machine gun fire. So there you go, moving into myth number two. And that is that the British Army just continuously used the same tactic over and over again. And everyone looked at it thinking, why are we trying the same thing again and again? Well, in reality, that isn't what happened. The Great War from 1914 to 1918 actually represents a period of time where there were massive changes in technology. Yep. In 1914, tactics included things like cavalry charges and generals riding across the battlefield on horseback, directing their men as, as waves charged. That's true. Look at the number of generals who died, just the British Army alone. Uh, the number of generals who died during the war. They they were, and a lot of that has to do with the artillery too. But yeah, early on, the, a lot of these guys are on the front lines. You have British generals getting killed uh, right in the thick of things. Towards opposing troops. 
Whereas by 1918, they were in tanks and aeroplanes and technology had changed so, so much. Yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of the guys who were in the cavalry in 1914 are in airplanes by 1916 or 1917 because the tactics are changing. The Germans never really developed tanks as a major weapon. They only produce about 20 of their own tanks. They did use a lot of captured tanks from the enemy, um, but artillery undergoes a lot of changes. You have the development of gas starts with like tear gas and smoke, but then they go to um, chlorine gas and then phosgene gas and then mustard gas. Uh, even the way they build trenches changes and you have development of defense in depth as a tactic. You have the Germans developing stormtroopers for infiltration tactics. Necessity is the mother of invention. The war is completely different in 1918 as it is in, is in 1914. And that's true for most wars. Things such as tank warfare that we saw in the second half of the Great War just weren't around in 1914. Yeah, first tank battle, September 1916 uh, at the Somme. So tactics did change quite a lot. Even the simple tactic of going over the top of a trench and charging across no man's land, that changed as well. Flamethrowers. adapted to things like creeping barrages with artillery moving in front of troops. And so the creeping barrage, and I got a bird outside my window today. You might be able to hear it. Creeping barrage was used before the First World War, but it was really kind of perfected in the First World War. And by the second half of the First World War, for example, the British had this thing down to a science. I mean, they could they could have a creeping barrage out just a few yards in front of their line because they really started to develop things like being able to do artillery spotters and with the airplanes, they could very quickly kind of communicate where the front lines were and all that kind of stuff. The techniques around that got better through the course of the war. So actually, it's not really the case at all that we just used the same tactic over and over again True. and then wondered why we got the same results. The tactics were changing all the time. Moving swiftly into myth number three, and that is the myth that most soldiers spent weeks, months, years on end in the frontline trench. And I'll acknowledge that when I first studied, started studying the First World War, I believed this as well. I didn't realize that there was actually most armies had a, a pretty regular system of rotation. Well, actually, it was fairly routine for the armies to rotate soldiers in and out of the frontline trenches, and in fact, in and out of the trench systems altogether. In the British Army, for example, it was fairly normal that a soldier would only maybe spend as few as 10 days in the trench system, sometimes as little as three days in the actual frontline trench. And notice he said trench system. We talked about defense in depth, right? You've got a forward trench, you've got a... Um... You've got a reserve trench, you've got communication trenches that run between them, sometimes three or four lines of trenches. And, and yeah, you might spend a day or two or even three on the front line, then you might ro rotate to the reserve trench. And of course, you always are hoping that if an attack comes, it doesn't happen while you're on the front line. It was understood that those frontline trenches were a very stressful place to yeah. be. In some cases, there was little or no sleep. So it wasn't in the army's interest to leave the same people out there for too long. They would rotate them from the frontline trench to the reserve trench, to the back communication trenches, and then out of the trench system altogether. Sometimes it was normal for a soldier in the British Army to spend up to a month outside of the frontline trench. And that's one of the reasons why when you look at maps of the front lines in the First World War, it might seem like a division has a very short front line for, you know, if a division's got, uh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20,000 men in it, why is their front line as short as it is? Well, if you have 10,000 men, you might only have 2,000 that are actually on the front lines. The rest are in support trenches, reserve trenches, or not in trenches at all. Um, so at any given point, only a, a, a small percentage of your strength is actually on the front lines. And, and because of the artillery, the constant artillery, it was just psychologically important. They talked about that. They, they mentioned that in Band of Brothers. You hear in Bastogne, uh, as Winters is narrating about the importance sometimes of just pulling a guy 50 feet off the line, psychologically what that does. And, and if you figure the artillery is nonstop, I, I read a... Um, a uh, description by, it was John McRae, the guy who wrote In Flanders Fields. And he had written a, a letter home to his mom during the uh, Second Battle of Ypres. And he's talking about how for a period of like three weeks, there hadn't been 60 seconds 
without the sound of firing, either by small arms by art or artillery, in three weeks, not 60 seconds without being under fire. That's the psychological impact of being on the front line and why they wouldn't keep you there. Jeez. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes in moments of, of emergency or attacks, mm. things like that, they would spend longer in the front line right. trench. But even then, the armies would normally try to make sure it wasn't any longer than seven days right. in the front line trench. Okay, moving into myth number four. And that is the myth that this was very much a working class war and that the upper classes got off lightly. Well, actually, that wasn't true either. In the Great War, there was a system where a lot of the junior officers were recruited from the upper social classes. Mm -hmm. They often came through private school systems, and a lot of young men from the upper classes became junior officers. Right and, and you know what? That is not unique to the British Army. It was that way in the American Army for a good period of time as well. And even in the First World War, a lot of the guys who end up these junior officers are guys who were lawyers or had some kind of college education pre-war uh, that wasn't unique to any one army um, but these guys also a lot of them had a military school education roles such as captains in the great war now those roles were incredibly dangerous in a lot of cases yeah. roles like captains for example would be the first man out of the trench over the top to charge across and lead his men across no man's land and if you go to the cemeteries which are everywhere over there you will see how many officers died the officers i think in higher percentages than the private soldier We've talked about examples of this on this channel. We did a video about Captain Charlie May as he led the 22nd My Manchesters. Mets. Now, when you actually compare statistics, about 12% of ordinary men, privates in the army, were killed during the Great War, whereas actually 17% of officers yep. were killed in the Great War. It's a so great you know, stat right there. Percentage chance, you had more chance of being killed if you were an officer than you did if you were a private. I mentioned mm. private school systems. Well, actually, Eton had a thousand casualties of ex-students from their school. And Eton, that's where a lot of the members of the, the royal family went. And uh, the Queen Mother, who was the mother of Queen Elizabeth II, she lived until about 20 years ago. Uh, her brother was killed in the First World War. Um, uh, there, there were a number of members of royal families who died during the war. That's 20% of the total number. I think his name, by the way, if you're curious, his name was Fergus Bowes Lyon, was the name of the Queen Mother's brother who died. Ex-Eton students who served in the Great War. And lastly, moving into myth number five. And this kind of relates slightly to myth number four. And that is this perception, the phrase that you hear all the time of lions led by donkeys. And that the generals were sat safely in the back, sipping tea, sending line after line of troops to their deaths. Well, actually, generals in the Great War were much more involved in some of the frontline operations than probably a general would be in modern day warfare now. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I think the description is fair if we're talking about like the top echelon guys, right? Like army commanders, army group commanders, guys like the uh, um, the Douglas Haggs of the world or uh, Sir John French or Ferdinand Foch. Uh, in that case, maybe that's the case. And, and we have stories of high ranking generals, for example, a general who goes to the front lines near the end of the Battle of Passchendaele and is incredulous to learn that they've sent men to their deaths on terrain like that. But yeah, most of these generals were very close to the action because remember, you've got, uh, you've got brigade commanders, you've got division commanders, you've got corps commanders. They're there. It was very routine for the generals to have to visit the front lines, maybe even every day, to inspect their troops, inspect the areas down there. And in fact, more than 200 generals were killed, wounded, or captured there you go. in the Great War. 200. It was not a case of them sitting safely at the back, avoiding all the danger, and letting all the privates and the junior officers do the dirty work. Generals were visiting the front line and putting themselves in danger all the time. Well, there you go. That's just a few, right? There are other myths associated with the Great War as well. But hopefully you found those five interesting. Do me a favor. Let me know in the comments other things that you think or maybe um, comments or suggestions on things that you might think are myths related to the Great War. And I actually texted Rob today and that's a very unflattering image to leave him on there. 
Um, so I'll, oh, I turned myself off. We don't want to do that. We want to turn Rob off there. Um, yeah, I actually, I texted him today and told him I was going to be doing this reaction. And he said he's actually thinking about doing a second one with five more myths. So be looking forward to that. So check him out. Link is in the description. If you want to watch all his videos, I'll show you some examples of some of the stuff that Rob has uh, on his channel. He's got 5.59K subscribers right now. I see no reason we can't get him well over 6,000 here in the next few hours. He's got 53 videos. He does a lot of shorts. Um, here you go. Uh, I was there with him when we were in Bastogne, so he shows the spot where the Third Army broke through, um, stuff about Rene Lemaire, uh, who's the nurse that you see in Band of Brothers, uh, there's stuff from Foy, uh, Dunkirk, uh, stuff from the Psalm, and I know he's going back to the Psalm as I am in just a few weeks, and we're going to be in Normandy together. So check him out. Hope you guys enjoyed this. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.